The master of the Renaissance pulls the crowds here in Paris. Asterix is back with a female heroine this time. And director Ken Loach takes on the gig economy in his latest film. That's all coming up in today's show. We're starting off here in the French capital with a new exhibition showing at the Louvre. It's part of a year's worth of events paying tribute to Leonardo da Vinci on the 500th anniversary of his death. Bringing together this significant collection of artwork was no small task and one which required some diplomacy between France and Italy too. The result is the largest showing of da Vinci's work ever assembled in one place. Monty Francis reports. At the heart of the Louvre, you will find the most ambitious exhibition ever imagined, featuring the work of Leonardo da Vinci. Apart from the Mona Lisa, which is fragile and will stay in its usual place at the museum, this retrospective is an undertaking without precedent. 160 paintings, sculptures, and drawings gathered from Italy and France and displayed together. Coming from the Vatican is portrait of a musician. Also, St. Jerome in the Wilderness, a tour de force. I'm used to being under pressure in this job, but it's true that for this Da Vinci exhibition, you have to have some very strong shoulders to carry the weight. For Vincent de Louvain, this exhibition is like running a marathon. Ten years of work, including five years of negotiations to include works that rarely travel. After some back and forth between Rome and Paris, a deal was finally signed and terms agreed to during a meeting in Amboise, France last summer. The Italians naturally consider Leonardo da Vinci as a big part of their heritage. And they didn't understand why the French were organizing this retrospective. In a spectacular turn of events, some days ago, a court in Venice blocked the departure of the famous drawing known as the Vitruvian Man. There's always a risk when you're moving a work of art. Moreover, we want to prevent losing a symbol of a national identity. But the Vitruvian Man, the second most recognized work of da Vinci after the Mona Lisa, will appear at the Louvre after all. The ink drawing, said to represent the ideal proportions of the male human body, is very fragile and will only appear for half of the exhibition before returning to Italy. On the day of the opening, there was still uncertainty about the work known as Salvador Mundi. The painting sold at auction for more than $450 million, making it the most expensive piece of artwork in the world. The Louvre is still asking for Salvatore Mundi, and we're waiting for a response from the owner. The owner is said to be Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Reports suggest the painting is aboard his yacht in the Arabian Gulf. The last time it was seen publicly was when it was sold in New York in 2017. To a beloved comic character now, the new Asterix album has just been released worldwide. Asterix and the Chieftain's Daughter is the saga's 38th installment, and it's the first time in its 60-year history that the story features a female protagonist. That honour goes to a young lady named Adrenaline. Clement Bonahal has more. Meet Adrenaline, the teenage daughter of the Gallic Chieftain Vercingetorix. She's fierce, strong-minded, and she's about to turn the world of Asterix upside down. For the first time in the saga's 60-year history, a female character takes centre stage in the 38th comic book adventure of the world's most famous indomitable ghoul. In previous books, there were hardly any female characters, and that's because most of the readers were men or boys, not women. Asterix and the Chieftain's Daughter is the fourth book by writer Jean-Yves Ferry and illustrator Didier Conrad. They took over from original creators Albert Uderzo and René Goscinny, whose daughter Anne has been supervising their work. I think that Adrenaline is definitely in tune with the times, but she also fits with the spirit of the saga. She's a character that my father could have invented. The Asterix comic books, created in 1959, have sold more than 370 million copies worldwide. As well as being translated into more than 100 languages, the books have inspired a dozen movies and cartoon series. 
Next to a film that casts an unforgiving eye on modern Britain and the struggles that many people face in these cash-strapped times. Sorry We Missed You is director Ken Loach's take on the so-called gig economy. Known for his hard-hitting social dramas, the veteran filmmaker sat down with France 24's Eve Jackson at the Cannes Film Festival earlier this year, where his film was in competition. Ken Loach, hello. Hello. I, Daniel Blake, which won the Palm d'Or in Cannes a few years ago, cast a spotlight on the UK's broken welfare system. Mm, this mm. film seems to have an even more universal um, quality, reflecting mm. the workers of people around the globe. Mm, Was mm, that your intention? Mm. Well, the, the issues of, of insecure work, um, I mean, they call it the gig economy, you know, where people work through agencies or they're zero hours contract where there's no commitment from the employer to give a certain amount of work and wages. Wages won't support a family. They won't even support an individual for often, you know, if it's casual work. Um, so-called self-employed. All these things apply across Europe and, and across the world. So, you know, if you tell a story about the consequences of insecure work and insecure income on a family that's already in debt, it should, it, it, if it's OK, it should have a resonance, really, around many countries. It's all right, Ricky, it's nothing to worry about. Hitting your figures and getting good feedback, everything's going all right. Just, did you have somebody in the van with you on Saturday gone? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it's my daughter, Liza Jane, right? Sorry, mate, we can't have that. Well, it's, it's my van, my insurance, it's my daughter. I thought it was my business. We tend to think of technology as fostering progress, but your film calls that into question. Um, are technological developments leading our societies towards new forms of enslavement, do you think? No, capitalism is doing that. The technology is neutral, knowledge is neutral. It's what use we make of it, it's who owns it, who controls it. When I was y a lot younger, we were told we had to be educated for our leisure time, because technology would remove a lot of jobs we didn't need to do. Well, anybody who knows how business works knows that is a fantasy because technology will be used to cut labour costs because if one business doesn't do it, the other one will. So they have to compete. They have to use the new technology to cut their costs and that means greater exploitation and more people out of work. Do you think society today is making families fall apart? Well, the pressures from this kind of work are very strong and very destructive. So, yes, yes, it causes division. Have you been in school today? Seb. How many days off have you had in the last month? Do you know what I mean? Your mum are going to get dragged in. They sent a letter about it last month, said we're going to get a fine, love. I know, but love. I don't know what's got into you, I really don't. You're a smart kid just like Liza. You used to be in all the top sets. What is going on? Just give yourself some choices, mate. Do you think by focusing on the Brexit debate, uh, has Britain lost sight of ordinary people's lives? Oh, there's so much complexity wrapped up in that. The Brexit debate was a phony debate. It was two choices between two, two versions of the right wing. Those who wanted to stay in Europe, they thought they, they could exploit people very sufficiently by accepting a few minor restrictions to support workers' rights or to protect the environment. The other version of the right wing was, no, we can exploit people better without the market because we won't have the minor restrictions on labour and the economy other than the environment. Um, the, the, the left alternative, which is we need a solidarity with European countries, but not based on this economic model, was never put. Has it blinded us to everything else? Yeah, sure, but that, that's the media misunderstanding or consciously choosing to ignore other alternatives because basically whether it's the BBC moving to the right, they're all committed to the market economy. They don't see that as the issue under, undermining everything. The film doesn't have a happy ending. You don't give the people an exit. No. Are you feeling pessimistic about the future? Um, no, I, I think it's a struggle. Politics is a struggle. There is, there's no end in sight, you know. Because there are competing interests and we have to mobilise our 
the vast majority of people against the, those who own and control and make vast profits. So it's a struggle and, and it's down to us to organise. This is my family. Thanks for the great day. And I'm telling you now, nobody messes with my family. <laughs> Master of your own destiny, Ricky. You up for that? Yeah. Well, to finish the show, we'll leave you with some imagery from the cutting edge of digital design. The Immersive Art Festival has invited 11 different studios to submit short audiovisual motion graphic design pieces which plunge viewers into an all-encompassing universe. Somewhere between digital sculpture and projection mapping, the work's on show at the Atelier des Lumières space here in Paris. And here's a taste of what that looks like. Do remember to check out our website and you can also keep up with us on social media too. There's more news coming up on France 24 just after this.